Hello, I'm Zay Harding. In the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, archaeologists began unearthing evidence of many ancient civilizations across the planet, civilizations that left behind remarkable ruins. Because they were ancient, they were often viewed as primitive. And because the writers of history and archaeology came from countries embroiled in war, these early civilizations were most often interpreted almost exclusively in terms of war, invasion, and conquest. Now, we shall see these civilizations in a new light and appreciate their accomplishments afresh. A case in point were the Romans. Often thought of as heartless militarists, they actually created a great civilization from the poorest of beginnings. And they did this in a unique way. They welcomed all people to their empire, from freed slaves to conquered communities. And they did this through twin values of individual courage and honor. Building cities, ports, and roads, the Romans managed a civilization that lasted for over 700 years. During the second and third centuries AD, Rome was the most magnificent city in the ancient world. The central jewel of the city-state that controlled all of the Mediterranean world and most of present-day Western Europe. But it didn't start that way. It started as a simple Iron Age village located on hills near the Tiber River in central Italy. From these humble beginnings, the early Romans overthrew an Etruscan king and created the first self-governing republic. 300 years into its existence, Rome had developed the most formidable fighting force on the planet, the Roman legions, and expanded its rule beyond Italy to the Mediterranean and Spain. At the same time, Romans had become superior engineers, building roads that have lasted through the centuries. Aqueducts bringing fresh water over miles of rough terrain to hundreds of thousands of urban inhabitants. And building bridges that can still be seen today. Artistically, however, the Romans lacked innovation. At first, they copied Greek styles in architecture. But when the Republic was replaced by an empire, the Romans, in typical Roman fashion, outdid everyone in the ancient world. Rome had started out as a small place with no buildings of any importance. By the time of the empire, uh, Rome was filled with gigantic buildings built of stone, uh, often faced with marble, gleaming uh, in the light, painted to be bright. On the Palatine Hill, where first there had literally been mud huts, uh, and then the houses of, of the rich, and now the giant palaces of the rulers, I mean, you could literally see how Rome had gone from practically nothing to the most impressive architectural monuments uh, that that part of the world had ever seen. When you walked around in Rome, you were just absolutely filled, even assaulted by visual images, color and pictures, sounds, of course. There are musicians and uh, you know, players all over. So it was an incredibly vivid scene. In, in which the Romans took great pride. The heart of that vivid scene was the Roman Forum. Forum in Latin means open space. Every great city needs great open spaces. No city has ever integrated open spaces better than Rome. By the end of the five great emperors, Rome had several forums, but the first and greatest 
is the Roman Forum. Designed to a precise three to two length to width ratio, it is situated between the Palatine and Capitoline Hills. Once a swamp, its drainage was a testament to early Roman engineering skills. During the Republic period, from 509 BC to 44 BC, the Forum was the most important place in Rome. Which is where Romans would gather for all kinds of interaction with each other, set up stalls to sell things to each other, have political meetings, uh, hold court sessions when you're trying to decide legal issues, have social interaction. So the forum becomes the real sort of place where everybody meets and greets and does the kind of business of every kind that was necessary uh, in this community. And as Rome became larger, the forum became filled with buildings to help facilitate these kind of interactions large buildings in which meetings could be held, temples in which the worship of the gods could take place, expressing the Roman idea that they could only survive, it can only prosper with the favor of the gods, and it was their human duty to always express their respect uh, for the gods. And so the forum became the real sort of center filled with, you know, personal electricity for all the kinds of interactions uh, that this community needed in order to grow and survive. After Augustus seized power, following Julius Caesar's murder, and stabilized the empire, the Roman Forum lost some of its luster and significance. In the imperial period, the Roman Forum had been marginalized, that is, Sure, the Senate still meets in the Forum. Sure, the majority of the high-end commercial trading and business and money lending is taking place in the Forum. But you're not going there to vote anymore. At its height, the Roman Forum might have looked like this. Some specific ruins still standing in the Forum today are temples, arches, and the basilicas. Normally, debates and business in the Forum were conducted outside. But if the weather turned foul, the action moved into the Basilica Emilia. One of its arched openings is a striking reminder of this once inspiring structure. One of the most impressive ruins is the Arch of Septimius Severus. Erected in 203 AD, it is totally sheathed in marble. The carvings are magnificent. At the opposite end of the forum is the arch of the Emperor Titus. It is adorned with a simple frieze running around all four sides. The forum was also the location of a number of temples whose present-day parts remain only as ruins. One is the Temple of Venus in Rome, built by the Emperor Hadrian. The Temple of Vesta was erected in 191 AD. One of the Forum's largest ruins is the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, erected in 141 AD. The oldest temple ruin is the Temple of Saturn, dating back to the era of the Republic. However, by imperial times, Rome needed more forums. Besides the Roman Forum itself, which gets too crowded after a while, there are several other forum spaces that are built by emperors. The Forum of Caesar, the Forum of Augustus, the Forum of Vespasian, who built the Colosseum, the Forum of Domitian, and the Forum of Trajan. They all have law courts, piazzas for gathering. Uh, there are temples to sacrifice to the various important gods that ensure the well-being of the state. There are places to eat. There are libraries to get access to. So there are people flowing in, buying, purchasing, renting space, hopefully seeing the emperor, hearing an important court case. All this is taking place 
within a relatively small area compared to what we consider downtown of a modern city in the, in the United States. A brilliant example of an imperial forum is Trajan's Forum and Marketplace. It too had a basilica, identified by these columns, and a fantastic open market. But the most impressive ruin here is Trajan's Column. Precisely 100 feet tall, it is made up of 19 cylindrical pieces of marble. Spiraling down, the column is the most extensive frieze in the world. It tells the story of Trajan's exploits. A less prominent forum is the Forum Boarium, located near the Tiber River. It contains the splendid four-sided arch of Janus, built in 372 AD. Opposite this arch is the oldest surviving marble temple built by the Romans, constructed during the era of the Republic. Just outside the Roman Forum is the Colosseum, one of the seven wonders of the world. It was called the Colosseum because it was built near the Colossus statue of the infamous Emperor Nero. The Colosseum is one of the greatest structures the Romans ever built. It's uh, 545 meters in circumference. It's about 50 meters high. It's composed on the exterior ring, when it was all still standing, uh, of about 100,000 tons of travertine stone. So this was a massive, massive construction. It's a great engineering feat. Uh, this took about 10 years to build. Originally, the top floor was probably in wood. It burns down in a fire in uh, 211. It takes five years to rebuild, and when they rebuild it, they rebuild it out of travertine stone. So this is a great lasting achievement of the Romans. Today it stands as a ruin, but it's also, uh, it's largely still there. Unlike earlier amphitheaters built in the ancient world, this is a massive freestanding circular structure. At the time of its completion in 80 AD, it was totally unique, totally Roman. This is not existent in the Greek world. This is a Roman invention. The Colosseum, though, has to be the biggest, has to be the best, has to be the most impressive, and it is. It had seats in tiers that could hold 50,000 people um, uh, for different kinds of shows, gladiatorial combats, you know, mock hunting of wild beasts, all kinds of shows of different kinds. Uh, and when the people poured into the Colosseum, they could quickly get to their seats and they could quickly empty the stadium too uh, because the Romans had built so many entrances and exits and designed it so well for crowd access. When the people were in the Colosseum, as at other Roman stadiums or amphitheaters, they were seated according to their importance in society. And so the more important person you were in Roman society, the closer you got to sit to the floor, as it were. And the less important you were, the further up you sat. Uh, women generally sat in the upper rows. Today, the popular image of the Colosseum is gladiators fighting to the death in front of an evil emperor. A great contribution, or a very interesting contribution by the Romans that's very famous still today, is the gladiatorial games. And these were first recorded in Rome in 264 BC. And they were uh, held on the occasion of the funeral of an important individual. So the Romans decided to honor the dead with games in which sometimes people would fight all the way even to death. And they hold those games usually in a very important venue, such as the Roman Forum itself or other important uh, forum spaces. And ultimately, in the imperial period, we'll see them fighting in an amphitheater. We'll see them actually fighting in uh, the Colosseum. In 
In 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine, along with putting an end to the persecution of Christians, also put an end to the gladiatorial games. The other great place of entertainment in Rome was the Circus Maximus, overlooked by the Emperor's Palace on the Palatine Hill. On the Palatine Hill sits a massive display of ruins. The Palatine is one of the seven hills of Rome, and as legend has it, here Romulus founded Rome itself. Augustus, the man who unified the warring factions of the Republic and laid the foundation for the Roman Empire, was born on the Palatine. And it was here that he built his home. The word Palatine has become synonymous with palace. The first emperor, Augustus, prided himself on living like an ordinary man. He wasn't an ordinary man, but he didn't dress differently, and he tried to live simply, and he had a nice residence on the Palatine Hill. But as the empire went on, and the first man, the emperor, became much more like a king, then their residences grew in splendor. More people were there to wait on them. There was more of a sense of majesty in the in the largeness of the rooms, or you know, building a racetrack, uh, or having all of the kinds of luxuries that the most important ruler in the world should have. And so over time, the residences of the Roman emperors began to rival the palaces of the greatest kings of the ancient world. One side of the emperor's palace overlooks the Roman Forum the other side, the Circus Maximus. Today, this once great chariot racetrack spreads out below the Palatine as a giant open space. Oval in shape, it is nearly 2,000 feet long and over 650 feet wide. It was the largest sporting venue ever constructed for public events. Chariot races were highly popular in Roman society. In 329 BC, the first starting gates were erected at Circus Maximus for the charioteers. And it wasn't until 600 years later that the last chariot race was run here. Built in 25 BC and modified by the Emperor Hadrian 150 years later into its present form, the Pantheon is Rome's greatest architectural and engineering accomplishment. Originally dedicated to the Roman celestial gods, it is today a Christian temple. One enters through a magnificent Greco-Roman portico but it is inside that one experiences a sacred space like none other in the world. The distance between the floor and the dome's highest point is equal to the floor's diameter, creating the harmonious feeling of being inside a perfect sphere. The best surviving example of what the Romans could do with their architecture is the building called the Pantheon which still survives today. And its soaring dome, uh, which encloses this incredibly large circular interior space, is the dome that the Romans built. It served as, as a temple, um, but in a sense, its shape is an imitation of the sky and of the universe. And so in a certain way, uh, the Romans are saying, by building this building, we too can create our own universe. This is a universe of concrete and brick and marble. That's the kind of universe that we build uh, in imitation of the universe of sky and earth that the gods built. 
If you were to stand inside the Pantheon, it is 150 feet wide and 150 feet tall. And this is a poured concrete vault. And this concrete vault still stands. It's never collapsed. It's never fallen in. And the width, uh, the diameter of the vault is so wide that it was never superseded in width until the 20th century. So when you look at, for example, the columns in the uh, porch, the portico of the Pantheon, what you see are rows of gray stone and rows of pink stone. These are granites. And so we look at them today and say, oh, beautiful. But the Roman would know where those came from. They would know that they came from Egypt. So the shipping cost and the size of these columns that are 40 feet in length. Well, to extract a 40 foot long column that weighs about 100 tons is very time consuming, very costly, very difficult. So you're thinking when you look at that expertise, skill, efficiency, that's what you're thinking about when you see Rome. Part of that display of Roman superiority was its spectacular baths. Resting on Celian Hill, one of the founding hills of Rome, are perhaps the most haunting ruins of the ancient city-state, the Baths of Caracalla. Built from 212 to 216 AD by Caracalla, the last emperor of the House of Severus, it tapped water from the incoming aqueducts. It's hard to imagine this place filled with 1,600 bathers from morning to night. A bath is like a health club, uh, and Romans would go every day to the health club uh, because most work started at the crack of dawn, and so people would knock off by the middle of the day. In the bath, you could bathe going from a warm room to a warmer room to a really hot room. In big cities, the baths would be enormous. They'd have swimming pools, cold and hot, rooms for sports, you know, open areas to play ball, libraries, places for discussions. Women would go in the morning, men would go in the afternoon. Sometimes they'd go together. All the Romans thought this was a little iffy. Um, it was inexpensive, so almost everybody could go, and almost everybody went every day to the Bath Social Club. Twice Rome was a walled city, first during the Republic. Only a few remnants of that early wall remain. Then for nearly the first 300 years of the empire, the city was wall-free. But around 270 AD, the emperor began construction of a wall to fortify Rome from barbarian incursions. Five years later, the wall was complete. Made of brick, it was nearly 20 feet high and 11 feet thick. Its length spanned 12 miles and encompassed some of the ancient city's greatest buildings. The most impressive is the spectacular mausoleum of Hadrian on the right bank of the Tiber. The famous statued bridge, the Pont Sant'Angelo, leads to the mausoleum the most unusual structure incorporated in the Aurelian Wall is the Pyramid of Cestius. It is a testament to Rome's long fascination with Egyptian culture. As archaeologists are in the process of excavating many of Rome's once fabulous multi-story homes, in and outside of Rome and in provincial cities, such as Pompeii, it is clear that Romans surrounded themselves with beauty. Everywhere inside their dwellings, 
they decorated with sculptures and the most exquisite mosaics made from colored stone and ceramics. Here is a sample. Rome's primary contribution to monumental architecture was the addition of the curve. The Greeks before them were masters of precise rectilinear shapes, exemplified by the Parthenon. But the Romans engineered spectacular curvilinear designs, great arches, the spiraling frieze of Trajan's column, the oval shape of the Circus Maximus, the massive circle of the Colosseum, and the sacred sphere of the Pantheon. However, not all of Rome's highest achievements were made of stone, brick, and mortar. The Romans gave us the first self-governing republic, where everyone counted, though not equally. Their phenomenal longevity as the dominant city-state was based on the concept of meritocracy, that is, an upwardly mobile society, where anyone could advance in status and wealth through meritorious skills and behavior. They created the first governing constitution. During the imperial period, the Romans defined the boundaries of present-day Europe and institutionalized Christianity, thus guaranteeing its place as a major world religion. This is the legacy of the greatest city-state the world has ever seen, Rome. Thanks for watching Ancient History, The Romans. I'm Zay Harding.